Uh, the children of light, uh, 
So you might remember that we have one of these children's light. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but competing in the Olympics in Beijing right now. How incredible is that? And then um, the U.S. hockey team, the 1980 gold medalist, uh, lighted in that point. So I just thought we're going to talk about that, one, but I just thought it'd be neat to just take a pause at the beginning of this and just think about uh, what this means uh, to our state, to our country, to the world. And uh, just tell one small story. Uh, Sarah Hughes uh, was the gold medalist in figure skating, and she was 16 at the time. Think of that. The pressure of skating on the ice as a 16-year-old. She was preparing for the SAT while she was here. <laughs> and she uh, was in third place going into the long program. And this is at the end of the long program. They throw the flowers out onto the ice. You see the big smile on her face. I was in the Salt Palace in the media center the morning after this as she addressed the international media. Probably a room about twice the size of this. Uh, just an incredible amount of cameras from all over the world looking at this new uh, gold medalist. And she said this, she said, not everybody gets the chance to skate the performance of their life. I did. Just this lovely reflection of how perfect it was that she, without uh, pressure to do that grace, was able to do what she had trained for. So just a great story, and I'll, I'll just share the, a couple of learnings and lessons that I have gleaned uh, from the Olympics. Uh, make every moment count because it goes fast. Just all of that preparation and all of that wonder that happens so quickly. Uh, big dreams can come true. Think of uh, Syracuse there. Think of Apollo and Tom Pono, some of those athletes. Uh, there will be setbacks, setbacks, some of them very large. And when 9 11 happened, it was a legitimate worry that the games would be canceled. Uh, so setbacks happen, some of them are very large. And then lastly, never give up on your desire to see the performance of your life. Have that optimism, of that uh, positive energy. Well, maybe that's a really good thing for me to share because now we're going to go talk about some economic insights. But it's a really tricky time. And I have struggled for the right words to bring to uh, the Bank of Utah economic outlook at this time. And I decided I was just going to like put in front of you some words and just have you think for a minute about what word to describe 2021, what word to describe 2022. I put a few of them up here. Um, divided country, frustrated, I got hopeful on the list, uncertainty in the economic environment. Uh, emboldened. Just go ahead and think about what word you would think about. I have definitely felt all of these, um, but honestly, I'm, I'm feeling a bit uh, ill at ease, a little disquieted by the, the circumstances we find ourselves in. And at the same time, I feel hopeful. And I want to be really, really clear in this presentation that I feel more hopeful when I'm in Utah County than almost anywhere else in the state. <laughs> And that's uh, coming from my background in economics, but the numbers here are so overwhelmingly positive. Like, we're so proud that we're the fastest growing state in the nation. We're so proud that our economy is the fastest growing economy in the nation. We would not be in first place uh, without the time. It's that significant what's going on here. So, I'm really bullish on Utah, I'm bullish on Utah County, but we've got some challenges. And I'm going to open it up, uh, these challenges, by just uh, sharing a very provocative uh, letter to the other editor that appeared in uh, the League magazine. This was on December 31st, uh, 2021, right as the last year ended and this new year started. I'll read this to you. Uh, and, and again, this is one perspective. Uh, you may not agree with it, but it's, it's uh, being said and important that you reflect on, and then I'll share something else a little bit right. This one's kind of dark. Uh, this was a dark time in the dark year. It began horribly with a violent assault on the capital intended to stop the peaceful transfer of power, a first for our nation. The climate, speaking of climate change here, the climate showed us where we're headed as biblical droughts bake the West and suck reservoirs dry. 115 degree heat waves paralyzed Portland and Seattle, and a polar cold snap froze Texas solid. Forests in the western U.S. exploded in flames. 
monstrous tornadoes almost never seen in December to raise communities across Kentucky and the Midwest. The pandemic we thought would be in the spring roared back twice through Greek letter, mutation disguised variants that have filled hospitals and morgues with voluntarily unvaccinated. In this season of renewal and hope, it takes real effort to find optimism about the future in our sour, beleaguered hearts. I told you this was a bit dark. <clears throat> um, he continues one more paragraph. It says, we can reasonably hope the pandemic will wane this year after holding humanity hostage for more than two years. But there's no reason to expect an end to another viral epidemic of misinformation and tribal hatred that endangers our democracy. Americans no longer share common facts, information, or trusted sources and experts. Extremists on both sides are pushing the parties further apart. And on the right, a radical anti-democracy movement is gaining momentum. Three retired U.S. generals warned this week that a disputed presidential election in 2024 could cause a total breakdown of the chain of command of the party lines and actual civil war. If that sounds nuts, remember that two years ago, an insurrection and a pandemic were just as unimaginable. In the face of so many troubles and sorrows, what do we do? For perspective, I often think back to what my parents' generation faced and how dark it must have felt as 1941 gave way to 1942. Then, as now, surrender was not an option. Curse the darkness, persist the light of its coming. All right, well, that's meant to be provocative. Uh, my job is to make you think when we get here. Uh, I would fully acknowledge that some of the workforce there can be kind of triggering and, and maybe even uh, is uh, unfortunate. Um, maybe it's an extreme position. But the reason I wanted to share it with you is that these are, these are feelings and thoughts that are held by some in our country. And the feelings and thoughts that are affecting markets and affecting decisions. And I also want to draw a contrast, the juxtaposition between what I just read to you and what life feels like here in Utah and feels like here in Utah. It's different. Some similarities, but it's different. And so the, the, the juxtaposition I want to share is what Speaker Brad Wilson shared on the first day of the legislative session. This would be in uh, early uh, January or mid-January, where he said, it is, this is in his opening remarks. It is said the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change, and the realist adjusts the sail. And he's obviously saying in Utah, we're going to adjust sails. We're going to act. Then he says, with deliberation, with cooperation, and with determination, we can create a future we all want. Let's be bold as we chart the Utah way forward. So quite a just juxtaposition, right? In the, in the first quote, the gentleman ends with eventually, like, you know, eventually, maybe we'll figure this out. And what Brad Wilson is saying is, hey, onward, like we got a lot of um, power and the ability to control our destiny. Let's go make decisions and do things that keep us prosperous, that keep us united, that keep us moving to this right. So, all right, so that's my setup. And uh, the metaphor that I'm chosen, choosing to do is, is I'm going to invite you into my own kitchen and invite you to help me make a warm winter stew. And the idea is, as I said with a gentleman here before, that there's a lot going on. We've got a pot that has a lot of ingredients in it. And I'm going to like bake this, I'm going to cook this stew with you. And it's uh, made in Utah, and it's, it's going to have the flavorings and things that you would like. Uh, but I, I, I picked stew because it comforts, it's a comfort food, and I also picked it because it has a lot of ingredients, and that's what we're dealing with right now. Now, just to be uh, a little bit humorous, I told our, uh, our graphic designer when I was making this presentation, you know, get, make me an image of a warm winter stew. And this is what he gave me. And that's true, that's true. And I was like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant, but it's in that All right, so uh, we're making this stew, and uh, what I want you to think about, well, I've got chefs that I've been inspired by, and 
and share some of the people that have written these books and these magazines. Um, I've got Peggy Noon and Patriotic Grace. She wrote that after 9 11. I think it's a beautiful uh, book about our, our citizenship, what we need to do as, as citizens. Uh, the Soul of America by John Beecham, historian that writes about things happening in our world. A Time to Build by Paul Levin. Uh, a Time to Build is about our institutions and the need to invest in institutions. Uh, Paul's Arrow is a nice, uh, incredible write up about the pandemic and what it's meant to our world. Uh, the Upswing by uh, uh, Robert Putnam that talks about uh, basically inequality and uh, cooperation in our world. So these are the these are who I've been inspired by, and we're going to make this beautiful made in Utah stew. Here's the the uh, initial uh, uh, recipe that I'm I want to talk a little bit about history and context. Then I want to uh, talk about some business intelligence things that we use to make decisions. Uh, I've got some guiding principles I'm going to suggest to you that are coming out of this part. Uh, it's part of the flavor profile, the principle of how we can. Uh, work through these uh, challenging times. How about some strategies to succeed? And then certainly uh, part of the recipe are some seasonings. Does that sound okay? Get a little recipe there. So here's the seasonings. Uh, I want to talk about bounty and spread. I want to talk about the housing shortage, the great resignation, and something called I the I. And I'll walk through each of these just briefly. So the first one is this notion of um, bounty and spread. And this was one of the books I didn't highlight it, but it's, um, this is the book, The Second Machine Age. And what the author documents is that there's something changed, something's changed in our society. And if you go back to when this graph starts, I think it's in the 1960s or whatever, this is showing uh, income, wages by different education levels. And it's indexed to start in 1967, that the one says there, so that you can show how it's changed uh, since then. It's adjusted for inflation and it's adjusted for experience, and, uh, and it's put on the long term so you can see it all in one chart. But what I want you to see is at the start of this chart, how wages they're different by education level, but they're all climbing. Everybody's doing better. And then you can see in the 70s how we move sideways. And then you can see that starting in about 1982, this is when Time Magazine declared, declared the personal computer the person of the year. You can see how incomes start to, to spread, right? In the information age, different income levels are rewarded differently because the economy is rewarding innovation, ideas, uh, well-educated engineers, computer scientists, um, you know, I'll have an architects instead of one, but the service industry and whatnot. And so the bounty is all of the wealth that's created in the information age, and the spread is that it affects people differently. So that's one ingredient, that's one seasoning in the model. Another seasoning is that we face economists hate imbalances. We have an absolute imbalance in Utah in our housing market, where we have a housing shortage right now. This is showing you price appreciation year by year, annual to annual change. When it's red, you know, prices are, are declining. When it's gray, they're up. But you can see at the very end the really incredible price uh, appreciation and pressures that uh, potential homeowners are, are, are facing. And it's a really interesting um, challenge because if I compare new households built with new household forms, which is what this does. The black is going to be uh, new households built. I'm looking at this. Yeah, new housing units built. The red is uh, new household formations. But notice how the black bar is always above the red bar. So we're, we're building more than we need. And so there's a nice uh, surplus there, keeps the market healthy. It's not out of control. So this is the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. But when we get to the last decade that we've just come through, Note how the red bar is above the black bar for much of the decade. And then underneath what's happening is we're accumulating a housing deficit or shortage or gap. And then towards the end of the decade, we start to make some improvements. But our office estimates that we're about 45,000 housing units short of the housing market. And all sorts of crazy things happen, like days on the market. This is median days on the market for the state, which has fallen to like six days, something like that. 
Um, that's a seasoning in this pot and affects so many things, right? It's affecting home ownership for, for the younger generation. They're, they're being denied the opportunity to start accumulating wealth earlier in their lives. Um, it's affecting our labor shortage. It's affecting uh, business decisions. So we have a big shortage. That's a seasoning. Next one I want to talk about is the Great Resignation. Uh, this is the idea that we have a labor shortage of people that have left the labor force. And the best way that I can explain that is that the pandemic shocks the system and people react to that shock. Some people drop out of the labor markets. They have to care for their kids who aren't in school or don't have a child care. Some people have to drop out of the labor market because they were um, laid off and got frustrated and stopped working for work. The one that's really interesting is 55 and older. And so this is, if you, these three different colors are different age cohorts. That red one that shoots up, that's 55 and older. And you can see in the pandemic how it shoots up. Well, what's shooting up? It's the percent of those of working age, 55 and older, in this case, that can drop that labor They're not working, they're not actively looking for work. And this, you know, that's a big change. And what that means is that all of a sudden we have fewer workers and we have lower labor force participation rate and the market gets tighter there. And that's really seasoning. And everybody wants to know why is that happening? Uh, some of you will know this, um, but if you're 55 or older, you know, you've paid for your home, you, the stock market's been doing really well, um, you couldn't spend money during the pandemic, you have excess savings, you have pent up demand to go travel and do things, and people have the means to not work, and so they stop. The last thing I want to give you is by the eye, and this is the work of Robert Hubbard, where basically, when this graph is on the lowest point, that's I. When it's the highest point, that's B. And when it's at the lowest point on the far right, that's I. It's a measure of um, connectedness, cooperation, uh, working together, collaborating. And what uh, Dr. Putnam did is he looked at four different uh, threads economics, politics, society, and culture over a long time frame, from 1900 to the present, and said, what did we see in terms of the level of cooperation? And the Gilded Age is where this starts. And there was a lot of individualism, um, not as much community. And then it starts to change. And by the time Eisenhower becomes president, we're very collaborative, we're doing things together, and forming institutions, investing in the future of our country together. And then we go through a period where we're, we're dropping to the I side, which we are at. So this is just a really interesting trend. And I, I throw it out there because it's a seasoning because of our, our country and our state, our communities are, are challenged by how do we do things together? Like we're in citizenship together. Where, where does individualism stop and citizenship begin? Am I being dramatic enough? Okay, is this getting y'all thinking? <laughs> okay. So because so, now what I'm going to do with the soup is I'm going to put in the ingredients. And the ingredients, as I mentioned, start with just some context. And the context I'm thinking about is what's going on in our world right now that we should be thinking about. And, you know, COVID is big on the list. You'll see that there, Omicron, Delta, whatever, where we've been. Uh, China is uh, important. It's on that list there. I've got climate change there. I've got uh, rate hikes. Um, I've got uh, maybe another one I'll highlight is decentralized finance. You know, you've got just all these changes, all this uncertainty. And so certainly this is um, something we should be thinking about as we're cooking the soup. But as I think about what's happening, I want to be really clear that Utah is different, and by extension, Utah County is different. How are we different? Well, we're the fastest growing state in the country. This shows all the states, their growth rates from 2010 to 2020, decennial census years, really accurate data. We grew by 18.4%, uh, the nation grew by 7.4%. So that's a demographic cushion that creates more opportunity, uh, a larger marketplace, um, more customers. It's, it helps, it well differentiates us. In fact, this is super interesting. This is the share of growth in 2021 by county. And I'm having fun here because we should put Utah County blue for the red. <laughs> <laughs> but 33. 
percent of our state's total came from this council alone in 2021. And you can see how it compares to other counties. This is the place, right? It's got proximity to economic activity. It's got buildable land supply. It's got silicon slopes deeply embedded here. It's got two major universities and close access to other uh, uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, this, this is a place that um, you might say is quite popular. And it shows up. Here we show you the absolute change in county population on the left and the percent change on the right. And I'll let you just juxtapose, juxtapose what's happening in Utah County compared to the rest of the state. Super fascinating place. The population center of our state is right now in Saratoga Springs. So if everybody weighed the same, and they were standing on a flat surface, where would it balance? Saratoga Springs. It's the mean population center of the state. <laughs> All right, a little bit more context. Uh, where have we been? Well, this is job growth, Utah red, the nation in gray. The shaded vertical bars are recessions. So the great recessions that kind of big bar you see in the middle, you can see the drop in employment and it comes back up. But you see what we've just been through. We see what I mean, can arguably be called the V-shaped uh, recovery out of a very short recession that was pandemic related. But that's part of this context. And then perhaps the most interesting part of the context is that we are in the state that has the fastest growing economy uh, right now. And I'm showing that in, in employment growth here. I just find this fascinating. So 2019, how many jobs do you have in your state? 2021, in December, how many jobs do you have in your state? Forget the pandemic, just you can cap it here. But 2019, 2021, did you grow or did you decline? Look how almost every state in the nation has fewer jobs in 2021 than they had in 2019. Uh, it's Idaho, Utah, Arizona, and Texas are the only states right now that reduce those jobs. Think of your businesses, think of what you're wrestling with, what's going on, and recognize that your counterparts in other states are stability contraction while we've been growing. So I think that's super interesting. Here's the industry makeup. Look at construction growing as fast as it is. Uh, look at some of the others. This is a very healthy uh, job growth uh, profile. Uh, leisure and hospitality getting better every month that we measure this, uh, but still not out of the woods with the pandemic. And, mining that's mostly the energy sector and uh, it's it's definitely um, been hurt by a commodity crisis all right another <laughs> part of the ingredients and start thinking of your questions is just the business intelligence all this income all these things that you have to wrestle with uh what if what do we need to talk about well i've got a risk matrix for you here and on the vertical axes i've got the likelihood of something happening and on the horizontal axes the, the severity of it, if it does happen. And I, I've shaded in red the two things that are of greatest concern the pandemic future. And then, secondly, can the Federal Reserve um, land this plane in a way that doesn't create a recession or mis, uh, uh, misspecify what's happening with inflation? And then you can look at some of the other things, but you know, we've got uh, geopolitical conflicts. Social unrest. We have a lot of things that, that can be really difficult. I want to uh, talk about inflation for just a minute by emphasizing to you that we have an absolute uh, supply shocker going on in terms of uh, the global supply chain that's under incredible stress. This is a stress index that's showing that you can see where it shot, shoots off to. And each wave of the virus has just complicated this. But as the supply chain has suffered, Prices have increased, right? Supply constraints, things are more rare, prices rise. This is creating a significant amount of inflation in our economy. Uh, I will say that we're also getting it on the demand side. We can maybe talk about that in the QA if you'd like. So, this is the path that inflation's been. And do know that we've been under target for quite some time. The Federal Reserve targets an average of 2%. And, you know, we've been under that for some time. But as the pandemic hit, and as uh, some spending occurred, as the supply shocks hit, as the different waves, we've shot up. The forecast I show here is the Fed's current plan. The Fed believes that through their 
uh, policy tools that they can give us back to their targeting uh, sometime late 2022, uh, early 2023, or something like that. That's the plan. I don't know if this is a forecast that you agree on, but that's where that's where we're headed. Um, this is part of the uncertainty, right? This is part of the board that we need to think about. The other thing I'll mention is that we have a lot of money in the economy right now. And one way to show that is just stimulus. That top bar shows the federal stimulus from the dot-com recession. The second one shows the federal stimulus from the Great Recession, the financial crisis. And the bottom one shows what's happened during COVID. Nearly 25% of GDP. Just a stunning amount of money put out in the economy uh, to try and you know, deal with uh, the very real challenges that we've had. But, so there's supply side constraints that are pushing inflation up. And then there's a lot of money out in the economy, too much money chasing cheap, too few goods. We get a, a shocker. All right, so the last things I want to do is just for a second talk about, talk about all the ingredients in the pot, but I've also got some principles, some things as we create this flavor profile. What are the principles that should guide us? And I'm going to, this is pretty philosophical where I'm going here, but I hope it's helpful to your business and your thinking. Uh, Nicholas Pistakis, who wrote the Apollos era, said, Pandemics call for great wisdom, both in our leaders and in ourselves. And so I think the challenge to all of you as, as business leaders, as uh, leaders of your household, is to like use this time to um, really do the hard work, the unlearning, the inner work of uh, taking the right steps through a challenging time. Arthur Brooks said, we need national healing every bit as much as economic growth. And I'm just putting out a reminder here as I thought about these principles, it's not just about thriving economically, but how we heal our nation, how we heal ourselves. So I got some, obviously I've got some data to show you. But this is the, these are the principles that I came up with, three of them. Practice warm-heartedness, respect facts and deploy reason, and seek balance. So these are, this is what we live by. Like in, in this pot that I brought you into my kitchen and I'm creating this flavor profile, these are things that we must do as a guiding principles to get us through this tough time. So just take them each, uh, really just a quote for each of them, but on the warm part of this, uh, Arthur Brooks in the book that I, I said, um, that informed this thinking, he was talking with the Dalai Lama and he said, you know, how do you, um, how do you, what, um, what do you do when you feel content? And Arthur Brooks reminds us that contempt is anger mixed with disgust. Think of rolling your eyes. That's like one of the worst uh, signs of contempt. And the Dalai Lama said, when you, when you feel contempt, practice one of this. So I'm just thinking, someone you disagree with, all of these um, division, the complication of life, practice one of us. That's a guiding principle. Second one, and this one comes from John Beecham's book, on um, the soul of America, but he says there is such a thing as discernible fact. And so we really can deploy reason, and there really are facts. Um, it's taxes stifle innovation. I can show you a lot of data that would show that. The surface temperature of the earth is rising. Um, if you raise interest rates, you do things that, that can lower inflation. I mean, there's just things that we know. And so one of the principles that I think is really helpful is to say, you know, let's try to agree on some things and then deploy reason in that. So that's that kind of principle. And then uh, seek balance. I'm going to draw from my boss, the president of the University of Utah, Taylor Randall, who has said, when you focus on one problem, you lose perspective. And he likens it picking up a rock and keeping it too close to the rock. And you see just the rock and you don't see the context around it. And so as we and we wrestle with all these things in our pot. We want to keep seeing all of it. Um, if all we do is think about health during the pandemic, we don't think about our businesses, then we've lost balance because they're both important. So seeking balance is the part there. Okay, and then the last part is just some strategy. So I, I put all these you know, uh, ingredients in, I, I've given some thoughts on principles. What are some key strategies? I've, I've got four. Prepare for an economic resorting. It's afoot, it's happening, it's affecting all of us. Uh, 
Uh, take care of yourself and your people as a strategy through a tough time. Uh, care for those left behind. A little bit about in spread. It's one of the reasons why I think that's a strategy. And then invest in institutions. So on the economic restoring, this is structural changes occurring in our economy. Demographic changes, economic changes, behavioral changes. Um, we're becoming, um, in our state, a, a, a mecca for immigration. Wasatch County grew by almost 50% the last 10 years. Can you imagine the growth pressures that that is? But it's a Zoom town. Uh, the pandemic changed things. It was already a growth town, now it's even more of a growth town. So this is an economic resorting. Technological advancement, remote work, uh, telehealth, uh, uh, online education, those are all things that have been accelerated. Uh, remote sales. And then behavioral change, uh, people working from home, which I've chosen to highlight here. This is uh, the net migration from the urban core, just picking a few of our country's big urban centers. And you can see how the pandemic hits and how many people moved out of the urban core. They still work for these companies that are located in the urban core, but they're able to do it from suburbia, essentially, in rural America. So remote work here to stay. When I said uh, take care of yourself, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting some mental health data here. This is youth mental health in this case. It's got three different uh, data points, 2013, 2015, 2017, and then different indicators across the bottom of youth mental health. But note how the red bar is you know, higher than all the other bars. So it's getting worse, <coughs> and I'll remind you this is pre-pandemic. There's lag in this data. So when I say care for yourself and care for others, that's a strategy that I think is really meaningful. Uh, care for those who are left behind. This is the data on the learning disruptions for our future workforce because of the pandemic. This is Utah specific data that's shown by grade level the uh, drop in um, in um, education assessments that we've seen. Really serious. This is why our state legislature is spending so much time insisting that kids stay in school because this is seen. There's health issues and there's also education issues. We gotta think about both. And then lastly, investment institutions. This one we could spend a whole hour on, but this one uh, concerns look at the things that I've identified as institutions, families, the media, Supreme Court, churches, universities, clubs. So it's the durable forms of human life. It's things that we do together, associational life. And uh, they're in decline. We have a lot of measures of that. If you look at the bottom bullet, you've all read and said, when we experience, without these institutions, we experience a form of social shapelessness, a crisis of connectedness, and a need for social reclamation. So these institutions are struggling. Um, and you look at, uh, look at political division, this is partisanship uh, and presidential approval. We agree or do we disagree? We disagree. This is the emptying of the pews and the multiplying of the nuns, people that have no religious affiliation. So as this goes up, the gray line is no religious attendance, and the red line is no religious preference. So this is the sign of what's happening in, in churches, just, just as an example. So this is why I'm saying invest in institutions, because they're really important to our society, and they're feeling um, afraid. Uh, one last thing, I'll do that second bullet and come with the others. But when we have these institutions in decline, what happens is they start to use these institutions as platforms. Instead of ways to shape us, we use these platforms. And I'll just remind you that we have in the next six months a SCOTUS appointment, sorry, a Supreme Court appointment. We have a Roe v. Wade decision. We have the midterm elections. These are, these are the seriousness of the things that we have ahead of us. That's why I read that provocative quote. Uh, and then what happens is, is leaders, instead of being formative, they become performative. They, they engage in political performance art, and that's really dangerous. Uh, think of the media. Did I leave it on there? I think I leave it on there. Think of the media is just becoming like an entertainment enterprise rather than just a reporting the news. Well, that's the one we must do. <laughs> and I know we've got. Uh, 20 minutes uh, for questions. I hope I uh, share a lot of things that, that really get you thinking. Uh, Roger's going to help us with questions, and what I like to say is, I'm happy to.
Let's get Natalie a hand. Couple things before I have a question, so she has plenty of time to answer questions. But one is there's a survey on your table, so you have time to take that survey. That really helps us make continually make this better. And two, I saw a lot of you taking pictures of the slides. We're going to send you all out the slides. Okay, so you get those. And if you don't get those slides, just call your loan officer or your deposit person in the bank, or call me and say I didn't get the slides, and we'll make sure you get them. Okay, so you'll have the slides. So with that. Questions. I'll bring the microphone to you. Who's got a question for Natalie? Right here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Where at? Okay. One of the outcomes of the pandemic and the great resignation in terms of child care is that women have left the workforce more than men. And we've already been dealing with the wage gap. So in states that have seen a higher level of resignation, what is the impact on the wage gap? Is it widening across the board? Because Utah has been fairly notorious for having a larger wage gap than, it's, than other states. So what are we seeing there? Thank you for the question. I think this is enormously complicated, um, and I think your analysis is, is spot on. A lot of people have called this, it's a pandemic recession, but they've also called it a she recession, and it's because of how hard it's affected women. So it comes in multiple layers. Um, women have dropped out of the labor force to care for their children. They've dropped out of the labor force to teach their children. Men have done that too. It's just uh, predominantly women that do that. Uh, but the real thing that's interesting is so many of the occupations that have been most hard hit by the recession are really, or by the pandemic, I should say, are very dominated by women. So think of nurses. That's hard that they've been through. Think of school teachers, which are both very female dominated. And then think of um, whether it's hotel service workers. Uh, restaurant workers, a lot of them are women. They're the ones that you know actually shut down and got laid off and changed that. Order. So your question is spot on. That this has been incredibly disruptive. There'll be a lot of uh, research done on what it's meant to women. We're still not out of this. We still don't have all this. But specifically on the wage gap, uh, it has to make it worse. It has to make it worse because uh, I know enough about how professional life works. Do you drop out of the labor force? And then try to enter back in, you never recover. You know, your seniority, um, your placement, however it is, you don't recover. So that's something that society's gonna have to wrestle with. And it's one of these uh, long arm things in the recession. Or sorry, I should say the pandemic. You kind of twist it a little bit for the pandemic. What were your opinion on um, in construction now? It feels like you got this massive. So we're going about supply problems, supply chain issues, that stuff like that. If the interest rates are so low, all the developers of the workforce are going to build this. So to keep this inflation high, so even there's an interest rate, what are your thoughts on like the coming year in this battle that we have right now with really high costs, we can't get stuff, um, interest rate being so low, all that. What do you think you can see that? You can see why I picked this too, right? Because you have to put all these things in together and see how they come out. Uh, I'm of the opinion that. I'm in the mainstream world here that the interest rates are going to go up once a quarter for the next year, 25 basis points each time. Uh, and I think that's positive. Like, I think that, that needs to happen. There's no scenario where you can just keep interest rates where they're at um, and, and, and be servicing the economy correctly. There is a cost of our own money, you know. And uh, we've had to put them artificially low because of this massive shock to our system. And I know people can be critical of monetary policy, fiscal policy, but the truth is our country and this state have gone through the pandemic economically better than almost any country. The pandemic's hit us hard and harder, but uh, the United States of America has been aggressive in, in dealing with the way this pandemic shut down businesses and affected small businesses and hurt people. Um, I, I won't get it exactly right, but I mentioned that we're about 25% of GDP. 
aggressive in the morning that's between the 13 to 18 percent of cases. So we we've, we've been aggressive there. And and it shows in the data. You, you, you fiscal policy does work, but you should absolutely expect interest rates to rise. Uh, I would say that that's a positive thing as long as the Fed's doing a great job for it. And what would scare me is if they, um, you know, like if I saw them not do it in March, that I thought I think that I think it's time. <laughs> if they in March did a 50 basis point one, they will know us, right? It's a more gradual. So I'm watching for a very careful, you know, we always use the idea of a land of play, which is about what it's like. Do you think that's enough to use inflation? I, I, I do. Uh, you know, so the best way to think about inflation is what's causing it. And I try to say that it's supply side and demand side. If you break those down, supply side, it's the, it's the global supply chain. There's no fix. We will fix that. As the pandemic weighs its way out, you know, people are healthy, they go back to work, uh, chip plants real. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in supply chain right now. The market's going after that. So the market we will fix the supply chain. So that's a matter of time. Uh, on the demand side, the way we break it down is we say, well, we have all this stimulus. Well, guess what? It'll be spent. It'll make its way through. We have excess savings. That's, we didn't have a chance to spend during the pandemic, so now we can. And we'll spend that. And then we have pent up demand, this desire to go spend, which we're all doing, you know. And that pent up make works its way through. So my, my view on inflation is, and then you have the Fed raising interest rates. So my view on inflation is that we will gradually come down and, and perhaps the worst is over. The big wild card there is oil prices and geopolitical conflicts. You show us a graph of the accounts of the prices. Oh, what do you think is going to happen? Are they reached their peak? Are they too high? Or is the demand still going to drive them up? And you can put interest rates in there too. Yeah. Uh, you saw how that housing gap is starting to get a little bit better. And you also saw how construction is our fastest growing industry. So the market's going after this problem. Uh, our analysts uh, believe, and you know, this can always be subject to change, but they believe it's going to take some time to work through this, and, and maybe as much as a decade. So the idea is that we have a significant shortage and we have all this demand, and uh, we will, we won't, I think what happened last year was, was extreme, 23% appreciation. I don't expect that to happen again this year, but we don't expect it, the market to be at a healthy level for uh, maybe, maybe I'll say as long as five to ten years. So, what does that mean? It means that we're going to continue to have a fast growing construction sector. It means that we're going to continue to want to import labor to that sector. It means that there's going to be continued pressure on immigration reform to get us more workers. Those are the kinds of things that will happen. Uh, my analysts will want me to also say that it's important where you're talking about as well, particularly in the rental market. Right? If this isn't a, a, a blanket statement that all housing is going to be fine for the next five or ten years on the investment side, you have to think about where the, where you're investing the product you know, that you're putting out there. But as a general rule, our state has a significant impact, it's going to take a time. So I read a quote from uh, Larry Summers, and he's been kind of uh, <laughs> causing trouble. Causing trouble, but he said that the Fed has never successfully been able to raise interest rates to control inflation without causing a recession. I've been able to go check his data, but let's assume that's true. Um, there is a recession. Uh, how do you see that playing out specifically? You know, Larry Summers is um, one of the you know, most intelligent um, economic thinkers of our time. Um, I think he's the former president of Harvard University. He's certainly been you know, the Council of Economic Advisors to a president. I once heard someone who worked with him closely say he doesn't suffer fools. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm really reluctant to like challenge anything that uh, Larry Summers would say. 
But I, I will just know that you know recessions happen for a lot of reasons. They don't just happen because of interest rates rising. So like the Great Recession happened, and um, you know just for reasons other than uh, what the what the Fed did. Um, so how does it relate to Utah? I think we have a very active Fed that's that's willing to act. They're demonstrating that by the comments they're making. Um, I think we pretty much are assured that there will be a, a rate increase in um, March. I think that Larry Summers would say that that's probably what they need to do, but that he would take issue with the idea that we can do this with precision. Like it's it's messy, and that's probably true. This time is a little bit different. The Fed's also got a balance sheet to the plan. So it's taking 20 billion, 40 billion a month out of balance sheet type of money supply there, as well as some other um, interest, in, increase in interest rates. Your model, do you see how taking the balance sheet operates and then mix that with the raising of rates? Can that expedite this? Uh, the Fed wants to do policy wise? Yeah. How much has to be Yeah. Yeah, you know, so the Fed has been doing quantitative easing plus the plus the interest rates, and they're going to be doing this simultaneously and waiting this back. Listen, I, I don't know how to um, comment on all that they're doing. They, Mary Daly, who's the president of the San Francisco Fed, uh, you know, presented to some Utah leaders about a month ago, and I was able to interview her as part of that, and I asked her these questions, and uh, you know. I guess I would just say that they, they are arguably the best in the world at doing this. And they, they've got a lot of data to help them do it. But let's be really clear these are unusual times. <laughs> and uh, Mike Leva, who's been a mentor to me, our former governor, and, and you know, Secretary of HHS, when the avian flu, the H5N1 was kind of roaring its ugly head, they got controlled. But he said to me early on during the COVID pandemic, he said, uh, no leader looks good during the pandemic. <laughs> I just tell that out to everybody, right? Because you might look good for a season, but then it don't look so good. And my guess is the Fed's going to have the times when they look good and the times when they look bad. And if I were, I tried to kind of do these principles and, and strategies, but uh, you know, follow the facts, deploy reason, that's all we can do on this point. Yeah. Let's have one more question. And anybody have one more question out there? By the way, we've been in Logan and Ogden and Salt Lake. And yes. I'm, I'm trying to think who's giving me the hardest questions. These are very philosophical. Though. Yeah, this was, you guys are challenging. Yeah, I think they're good. And, okay, right here. We've got significant um, portion of those that are 50 and over that were part of, part of or still are part of the great presentation. What is the economic impact to organizations and all of the, the future uh, growth industries here in Utah County? When, or do you think we'll get them back at some point? What would it take to get them back in their work ethic and their experience that will help stabilize much of the workforce in Utah County? Yeah, super interesting question. You know, I, I think of trade offs here. So, one of the biggest losses is that we've lost that expertise. You know, there's a reason why people late in their career make more. They get experience more, they have more uh, to offer their employers and their employees. <coughs> and you know, they, they step aside. The trade-off is all these younger folks have um, been given are given more opportunity, right? You still have to fill those positions and fill them with the best that you have. And I think it's a really terrific opportunity. I'll give you a statistic that's interesting. Um, in the country, the baby boom generation is the largest generation out there right now. Uh, in our state, the millennials generation is larger than the baby boom. We have a large, large <coughs> millennial cohort. And, and then I would say that in Utah County, because of higher birth rates and a college town, and like that, you have a lot of fascinating demographics to work from within them. Uh, do I think some of these uh, great designers will come back? I do. I mean, just because 
I know what my father did, he stepped away, and they thought, oh, I, I got another opportunity, I'm stepping back in. I think we do see that. And so, uh, the way I would kind of process this is this is a shock to the system. Some parts of it will remain, but the system will also adjust. And in the process, some opportunities will be created for others. And then I go back to the sort of principles here practicing warm heartedness and deploying facts and reason and you know, seeking balance. In what we do. Well, Roger, Sherry, thank you so I'm much. Thank you, thank you for watching. Well, I want everyone to know that uh, this good uh, Bank of Utah, they do such great work in our community, and they make a donation to a uh, scholarship fund that the University of Utah can create, and I really, really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.